Be sure to follow this ministry on BitChute and Rumble, where you can see extended news coverage with biblical commentary. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube backup channel. Links are in the description box and in my pinned comment below. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is $Watchman1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. Welcome to the Watchman channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When a person comes to know Jesus as their Savior, they are brought into a relationship with God that guarantees their salvation as eternally secure. To be clear, salvation is more than saying a prayer or making a decision for Christ. Salvation is a sovereign act of God, whereby an unregenerate sinner is washed, renewed, and born again by the Holy Spirit, as we read in John 3.3 3 and Titus 3.5. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. When salvation occurs, God gives the forgiven sinner a new heart and puts a new spirit within him, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. The Spirit will cause the saved person to walk in obedience to God's Word, as we read in Ezekiel 36.27 and James 2.26. I will put my Spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. For as the body without the Spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So what about repentance? Repentance is not a work we do to earn salvation. No one can repent and come to God unless God draws that person to himself, as we read in John 6.44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Repentance is something God gives. It is only possible because of his grace. All of salvation, including repentance and faith, is a result of God drawing us, opening our eyes, and changing our hearts. God's long-suffering leads us to repentance, and so does his kindness as we read in 2 Peter 3.9 and Romans 2.4. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Ephesians 2.8-9 declares, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Works are not the cause of salvation. Works are the evidence of salvation. Faith in Christ always results in good works. The person who claims to be a Christian, but lives in willful disobedience to Christ, has a false or dead faith and is not saved. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. That is why John the Baptist called people to produce fruit in keeping with repentance as we read in Matthew 3.8. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. A person who has truly repented of his sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of a changed life as we read in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. A person who has not repented of their sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of the works of the flesh as we read in Galatians 5:19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. A person who has crucified the flesh and belongs to Christ 
will give evidence of the Spirit as we read in Galatians 5.22-24. through But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Believers are born again, regenerated when they believe. For a Christian to lose his salvation, he would have to be unregenerated. The Bible gives no evidence that the new birth can be taken away. The Holy Spirit indwells all believers, as we read in John 14, 17. The Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees Him or knows Him, but you know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit baptizes all believers into the body of Christ, as we read in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For a believer to become unsaved, he would have to be unindwelt and detached from the body of Christ. John 3.15 states that whoever believes in Jesus Christ will have eternal life. If you believe in Christ today and have eternal life, but lose it tomorrow, then it was never eternal at all. Hence. If you lose your salvation, the promises of eternal life in the Bible would be in error. Scripture says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember, the same God who saved you is the same God who will keep you. Once we are saved, we are always saved. Praise God, our salvation is most definitely, eternally secure. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates His own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today. There is nothing more essential to the world than the gospel of Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, Paul declares what the gospel is and how important it is to embrace it and share it with others. He reminds the Corinthians of the gospel he preached among them, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, that Christ is coming back for his church someday in the rapture according to the scriptures as we read in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 55. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? Jesus promised his followers he was going to go and prepare a place for them in his Father's house, where there are many mansions, as we read in John 14, 1-3. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. This is the essence of the gospel, the pure gospel of Jesus Christ, his death on the cross for sinners, his resurrection to everlasting life, and his coming back someday is central to our Christian faith. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 42, Watch therefore, for you do not know the hour your Lord is coming. 
I want you to know, church, that Jesus Christ could come this month. Or he might come next week. Or he could even come... Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Police in Arizona made a sad announcement this week about 16-year-old Faith Moore. You know, I'd like to start off by saying that miracles come in all sizes. Um, I'm here to announce tonight that uh, certainly light years away from the miracle that we were hoping for, of finding Faith uh, alive and well, um, we've recovered her body uh, along the banks of the, the Verde River um, about three hours ago. Faith went missing several days earlier when a flash flood near her Arizona town of Cottonwood carried away her car. Her car was recovered but the teen wasn't in it. The community rallied behind Faith and her family. Scores of volunteers helped firefighters look for her. Earlier this week, they held a vigil for Faith on the softball field where she played. Thank you to each and every one of you for being here, for praying, for helping find our girl. Faith's mother spoke to the crowd. We are living through our darkest hours. But to have your support, it's monumental. Now this close-knit community that was praying for a miracle is mourning its loss. Why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? We live in a world full of pain and suffering. And there is no one, including Christians, who are not affected by the hard realities of life. The question, why do bad things happen to good people, is one of the most difficult questions in all of theology. God is sovereign, so all that happens must be allowed by Him if not directly caused by him. We must understand that human beings cannot expect to fully understand God's thoughts and ways as we read in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. In the book of Job, Job was a righteous man, yet he suffered in ways that none of us can even imagine as we read in Job 1.1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. God allowed Satan to do everything he wanted to Job except kill him, and Satan did his worst. What was Job's reaction? Job's reaction was to trust God and to bless him. Job 1.21, and he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job 13.15 Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Even so, I will defend my own ways before him. Job didn't understand why God had allowed the things he did, but he knew God was good and therefore continued to trust in him. That should be a believer in Jesus' reaction as well. As hard as it is to acknowledge, we must admit to ourselves that we are sinners and there are no good people, as we read in Romans, 323. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Even on your best day, we are like filthy rags, as we read in Isaiah 64, 6. But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Bad things may happen to good people in this world, but this world is not the end. Christians have an eternal perspective as we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart. 
even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Bad things happen to good people, but God uses those bad things for good, as we read in Romans 8.28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Bad things happen to good people, but those bad things equip believers for deeper ministry, as we read in 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Bad things happen to good people, and the worst things happen to the best person. Jesus is the only truly righteous one, yet he suffered more than we can imagine, and we should follow in his footsteps, as we read in 1 Peter 2, 20-23. For what credit is it if, when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Romans 5.8 declares, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Despite our sinful nature, God still loves us. God loves the world so much that he sent his only begotten son to die for us, as we read in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God allows things to happen for a reason. Whether or not we understand his reasons, we must remember that God is good, just, loving, and merciful. Psalm 135.3 Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises to his name, for it is pleasant. Bad things happen to us that we simply cannot understand. Instead of doubting God's goodness, our reaction should be to trust him. As we read in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Nine people are dead after a devastating landslide in India. Boulders rolled down a hillside, picking up speed and momentum. This is in Himanshal Pradesh, the northernmost Indian state, situated in the Himalayan mountains. A minibus carrying tourists was crushed by the falling rocks. Crews rushed in to help, but for many, it was too late. Two people were injured and nine lost their lives. Dr. Deepa Sharma, one of the tourists who died on this bus, tweeted photos from the Indian-Tibetan border. This tweet was reportedly posted less than 30 minutes before the landslide. Just days earlier, monsoons in the western part of India triggered flooding and mudslides reportedly killing over 125 people. Is this the new normal facing the UK? A climate warning that is now all too real. From severe flooding to more extreme heat, unusual for these isles. A pattern the country is struggling to cope with. It's the shift in the baseline, what we regard as normal weather that is changing. Something that was relatively unusual is becoming much more common. Since the start of the last century, the sea levels have already doubled from 1.5 to more than 3 millimetres a year. And in the past 30 years alone, not only has the UK warmed by 0.9 degrees Celsius, it has also become 6% wetter. On paper, that may seem a small difference. 
In reality, this is the effect. The infrastructure is simply unable to cope. And there is no quick fix in sight in the face of the elements. It is part of a wider phenomenon of extreme weather across the continent. Recent floods in Western Europe have wreaked devastation. And rivers in Germany surge to levels not seen in hundreds of years. The race is on to find a solution as quickly as possible. The UK and Italy will host the COP26 climate change conference in Glasgow later this year. Set against a climate crisis that has seen all manner of extreme events around the world. The UK calls the summit the world's last best chance to repair the damage caused by increased carbon emissions. But there is little detail as of yet on what plans the world's 20 major economies have to prevent a further increase in dangerously extreme weather conditions. A giant water spout recently was spotted off Turkey's Black Sea coast. The huge whirling funnel cloud appeared near the city of Sinop. It's just one of several recent weather-related phenomena for Turkey in recent weeks. Heavy rains caused flooding so powerful it washed away a house. Oh, no. Hundreds of people were evacuated from their homes. And people weren't the only ones affected. A dog shelter was also hit. And rescuers had to work feverishly to save the canines inside. But at least a dozen dogs perished before they could be reached. Meanwhile, in southern Turkey, massive wildfires have destroyed homes and forests. At least 18 villages needed to be evacuated, and several people died. Firefighters are using aircraft to battle the blazes, which are not yet under control. Unusually hot weather has made those fires possible, and scientists say those temperatures, as well as the flooding rains in the north, are the result of climate change. A raging inferno dubbed the Dixie Fire in Northern California, consuming everything in its path, taking out this wildlife camera. It's now the biggest blaze burning in California this year and the 14th largest in the state's history. And for the people facing its fury... It's very stressful, uh, scary at times. Last night there was, you could see the glow of that, that hill right there. Once thriving, picturesque places have been transformed into eerie apocalyptic-like scenes. Homes turned to ash and vehicles completely charred through. Now, more than 7,800 people are under evacuation orders in Northern California after the Dixie Fire merged with the nearby Fly Fire. The uh, smoke is acid. It burns your lungs, you know. It's just uh, the oxygen level has dropped. You know, it's probably only about 85%. The Tamarack Fire, which has scorched nearly 70,000 acres across Nevada and California, is endangering wildlife. A burned black bear cub is now recovering at a wildlife care center after being rescued from the flames Sunday night. It's, it's just a tinderbox out there right now. And the effects of the fires burning on the West Coast and in Canada are being felt clear across the country, creating this haze hanging over parts of New England and triggering unhealthy air quality conditions. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather, as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven-year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16:21. God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16:8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, you had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. Psalm 18.7 Then the earth shook and trembled. 
the foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken because he was angry. To that breaking news overnight, a massive 8.2 earthquake shaking the coast of Alaska. That 8.2 magnitude quake happening just off the coast of the Aleutian Islands. I've been there, they're otherworldly, but this was just southwest of Kodiak and Anchorage. There have been some rumbles in those aftershocks and there will be more of that, but the good news is the tsunami watches and warnings have been canceled. This video from Homer, which is between Kodiak and Anchorage, shows you the line of the cars. People were saying, I'm out of here. The warnings were blaring through the sirens and people knew they had to get out. We've got more video here from Kodiak where the roads were starting to fill up. People were trying to find a safe place and thankfully they didn't need to. The tsunami only got up to about a quarter of a meter. Just one year after a bloody dispute involving Indian and Chinese soldiers, both sides are now deploying more troops along the 2,000-mile border between the two countries. Now we're seeing on the Chinese side roughly 200,000 troops, according to some estimates, flow into areas around the border. And what's been seen as the biggest deployment in India's history, some 50,000 additional soldiers are matching China's current troop strength in the area. Sources tell us the threat has been clear and present. India's deployment is about preparedness rather than triggering hostility. What's important is the sort of troops that they have. They have some uh, uh, pretty serious high altitude fighters embedded among them. Uh, this is a serious deployment designed to try to uh, make the PLA be very concerned about doing a land offensive again. Both sides are said to be building new roads, bunkers, tunnels, runways, and moving in advanced military hardware. The Wall Street Journal reporting that China has deployed surface-to-air missiles and anti-missile batteries, while India has beefed up its air force. Um, both India and China are nuclear-armed countries, and so if a confrontation does take place on that border, um, it would be problematic for the world and for the United States. Six decades after the Sino-Indian War, the world's two most populated countries are still going at it in the Himalayas. The last clash coming in June 2020, when Chinese soldiers took several square miles of Indian territory in the Galwan Valley. Indian soldiers fought back, losing 20 of their own. China says four of its men died, though that number is thought to be much higher. It was the deadliest incident between the Asian giants in 45 years. Dozens of high-level talks since then have failed to calm growing tensions between Beijing and New Delhi. The words and deeds of major military and political officials should help ease the situation and increase mutual trust between the two sides. But it hasn't, leaving India increasingly mistrustful of a powerful neighbor that's pursuing regional and global ambitions. The overt goal of the Chinese Communist Party is global hegemony, and that begins in the Indo-Pacific. Within the Indo-Pacific region, the biggest counter to their narrative is India. And the goal is basically to fragment and render India inoperative because India is the best hope for other democracies in the region to try to withstand China's uh, aggressive expansion. In the past year, Beijing has expanded political and economic fights, spreading to Vietnam, Philippines, Bhutan, Nepal, Australia, and Indonesia. This is not a one-off that China is only threatening India. Uh, this is part of Chinese aggressive behavior um, against all its neighbors, um, against any country it considers a rival. Indochina watchers say it's all part of President Xi Jinping's goal to also drive a wedge between Washington and New Delhi. What's very important from an American perspective is to understand that there is an active political warfare campaign designed to make us distrust and dislike India so that India and the U.S. can't come together to fight what is an existential threat for both of us, which is the Chinese Communist Party. Meanwhile, top Indian military commanders openly talk about their concerns of a simultaneous conflict with arch-rival Pakistan on its western flank and China to the east. Both countries continue to forge deep military and strategic ties. You could end up in a two-front war, you could end up in a war 
in which you know Pakistan engages in a conflict and then China opportunistically goes in to try and seize a bit of territory. So Indian forces are, are much more stressed now than they were, I think, even a few years ago. Experts now worry that with these additional troop deployments come possibilities of a miscalculation on either side that could result in more deadly clashes. China's building a nuclear missile silo field According to the recent report, now it's the second new silo field reported to be under construction in western China in just the last two months. Now in 2020, notably the Pentagon said China was set to double its stockpile of nuclear warheads, known at that point to be around 200. Now all this as the U.S. and Russia prepare for arms control talks and also significantly the U.S. has approximately 3,800 warheads, according to analysts. It seems as though we are on the verge of World War III. Jesus told us in the last days there would be war between the nations. Are we seeing the stage setting taking place to fulfill this prophecy? If so, then we're close to the time Jesus refers to as the worst time in the history of the world as we read in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. If we are that close to the tribulation, then the world is about to see war the likes of this planet has never seen before. The book of Revelation tells us when Jesus breaks the first seal, the Antichrist will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the second seal, war will be unleashed. Resulting from these wars will be famine, pestilence, and death as Jesus breaks the third and fourth seals. The Bible tells us 25% of the population of the earth will be killed at this time, as we read in Revelation 6-8. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed with him, and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. The population of the world is roughly 8 billion, meaning 2 billion people will die during this time. The remaining 17 judgments of God include devastating earthquakes, cosmic disturbances, scorching heat, meteors, 100-pound hailstones, volcanic eruptions, loathsome sores on those who take the mark of the beast, the seas, rivers, and springs of water turn to blood, demons torturing mankind, and a 200 million strong demonic army who will kill another third of mankind, bringing the total to 4 billion. Luke 21, 26 through 28. Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. One day Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! Place and I don't want you to go there. We've been reporting on the bizarre phenomenon that seems to be taking place not just in this country, but all over the world. Getting angry at God isn't going to solve anything. Don't but dad me, young lady. I didn't said you can see that boy when we get to church. This is not the way it's supposed to be. we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works and then Jesus said I will profess unto them I never knew you este ha sido una mañana muy espantosa de un catástrofe después del otro depart from me 
ye that work iniquity. So robes and positions and titles and classifications and auxiliaries and departments and works and paying your tithe and paying your dues will not save you. We are still experiencing the aftershocks of the massive earthquake that have devastated this entire region. But if you want to be raptured, you must be born again. Citizen of the South Korea, we're here one moment and going the next. You must be washed in the blood of the Lamb. It's so much. We've all been left behind. It's going to be joyful for those who are raptured, but it's going to be sad for those who are left behind. Life is life as we know it. You swore to me that you were going to get yourself together and start coming to church with me. Not today, okay? I'll go with you next Sunday. 